I never pictured my first trip to DC would be like this. Storytelling was never the division's strongest suit. In the first game, you took on the role of an agent who would eventually become the hero of New York, a second wave division agent flown in to bring order to Manhattan and get to the bottom of the mystery of the disappearing first wave agents. The first game's main campaign did nothing more than take players on a tour throughout Manhattan, all while introducing the various side missions and activities on offer. The sequel follows a similar pattern, but this time with a little more flair. Tom Clancy's The Division 2 throws gamers right into a world where your agent has been activated long before the game even begins. As such, and right off the bat, the game throws you into the middle of an attack on your base camp somewhere outside of Washington DC. After getting to grips with the basic controls, you are tasked with helping the capital fend off a new group of bad guys, the Hyenas. Now it is up to you to find out what their ties are to the already established enemy factions in Washington, known as the True Sons and the Outcasts. When compared to the first game, the immediacy of the threat in the introductory moments of The Division 2 comes across as rather jarring. The first game started players off with a set mission right from the start, flying them in by helicopter and ensuring they clear out Manhattan, all while simultaneously uncovering the mystery of a mysterious militarized group. In the sequel, you are a seemingly random agent tasked with saving Washington. The game does nothing more to explain who you are, what level of deployment you are a part of, or what your ties are to this base camp outside of Washington DC. At least for the first few main missions, all that is known is that you seem to be the only agent capable of rebuilding the Washington branch of the division, and getting to the bottom of who the hyenas really are. As the main campaign pushes forward, more is revealed. However, the narrative never bothers to link the first and second games as we hoped it would, which is a shame, especially for gamers who invested time in the first game. With that said, the most important thing to know by the end of the campaign is that it does take place some months after the events of the first game. Therefore, your character is a new one, and not the same agent from before, so it is a good thing then that the new character creation tool is quite extensive. Before you set off on your adventure, you can create a new agent by choosing from one of around 40 pre-made presets, 20 for each body type. Thereafter, you can customize your character to your heart's content with a plethora of hair options, sliders that fine-tune facial structure, and selections for skin tone, hair color, and even eye color. It's a vast improvement over the first game. Once created, your new character will represent you throughout the main campaign missions, all of which are true spectacles. The attack came from Jefferson Plaza. You know what to do. Hey! Kill them all. While the game does force you through the usual looter-shooter loop, as in go to a location, shoot bad guys, acquire loot, profit and repeat, it does offer a spectacular showcase of Washington's tourist hotspots. Every mission, whether it revolves around ridding a library of true sons, restarting a server farm in the metro, or even stealing the Declaration of Independence, the game offers a stunning showcase of flashy set pieces that will forever be memorable. These spectacles also extend to the greater world. From when you finally arrive in Washington, all the way through to the end of the campaign, you are graced with beautiful locales that are rife with realistic fauna and flora. The city is also in ruins, with vehicles littering the roads and an environment that clearly found inspiration from games like The Last of Us. While the game's setting is by no means post-apocalyptic, there is something about the post-epidemic Washington DC that makes The Division 2 not only feel superior to its predecessor, but also strangely and somewhat worryingly a bit scary. There is no denying that the setting depicted in the game is fictional in nature, but after having spent a good 30 plus hours in the game, we can say for certain that we feel more immersed in the world of The Division 2 than we ever did in The Division 1. I know you got your own problems to deal with. But them hyena m took my little girl. Get to me. 
If you can help, I'll be on your debt. And I'll always pay my debts. In terms of side missions, they include random objectives that will have you and your friends defending encampments, taking part in resource gathering, or even capturing pivotal points of interest back from the various factions within the game. Completing these additional quests will reward players with Shade Tech, which is used in character progression and aids in opening the game up for further side content, such as Strongholds, one of the many forms of endgame content. Your mom sent us to bring you home. Are you hurt? Who, who are you? What's going on? She's in shock. There is no denying that looter shooters are repetitive in nature. However, thanks to the amount of detail that Ubisoft and Massive have put into the design of Washington, the repetitive nature evolves into a wonderful experience where every corner and every street transforms into an event of its own. By the time that you take back some points of interest from enemy forces for the umpteenth time, it feels like second nature, not a chore or a grind. It goes without saying that loot and gear are huge aspects of any loot shooter, and The Division 2 is no different. The game wonderfully rewards players with new loot and gear after just about every single engagement with the enemy. Gear drops in various levels and is dependent on the level of the enemies you encounter and the level of your agent. At the start of the game, you'll be decking your agent out in Tier 1, Common or White gear, whereas Tier 2, which is Green, Tier 3, Blue, and Tier 4, Purple gear drops will become more and more common as you level up and make your way through the campaign. This superb loot cadence and reward system that the developers have put in place helps to alleviate the feeling of repetition, especially considering how hyenas, true sons and outcasts skulk around every corner of the city. When you engage and end up in firefights with them, they quickly turn from just a group of enemies to what feels like free-thinking individuals, all working together to bring the player down. The six or so enemy types found in the game might be a point of contest for many hardcore players. However, while there are effectively only six enemy types, they do come in various flavors, each catered to create a feeling of breadth and uniqueness among the many enemy factions. By the time we hit the level 30 cap, we dealt with pretty much every single hyena, true son and outcast that the game has on offer. It makes sense then that as soon as the players hit the end game, that a fourth enemy force enters the scene. They are called the Black Tusk. They are tough and really challenging enemies that force you into being the best agent that you can be. This is especially true as you go up against their arm to the teeth forces with your own neat new tricks, specializations. There are three specializations that agents can lock onto, each with their own new skill trees and signature gear. Once players reach level 30, they will have to choose to become either a sharpshooter, a survivalist, or a demolitionist. Their signature weapons are the TAC-50 caliber rifle, an explosive tipped crossbow, and an M32A1 multi-shot grenade launcher, respectively. Each specialization comes with their own set of unique perks and buffs and plays into the weaknesses posed by the others. It is therefore imperative that players who choose to take on the endgame strongholds be a full squad of unique specialists. With that said, clearing a stronghold with two demolitionists or sharpshooters is more than viable as long as communication is clear and concise. As players engage with the Black Tusk forces, they will enter new endgame difficulty tiers called World Tiers. These determine the difficulty of the enemies faced by players as well as the loot that can be earned. Endgame and prestigious loot are commonly referred to as gold or legendary loot. Players will then revisit old missions, whether from the main campaign or otherwise, and redo them. This time, however, with brand new variables in place. Modified variables include how the Black Tusk enemies do not spawn in the same location that old enemies do. Level designs are also utilized in different ways, making gamers play from different points of entry. Thus, objectives are often different from what they were before. Each successful mission will net players with rewards that can be used to level up their specializations and further inch towards the next world tier. At launch, there are currently four world tiers, each with more challenging opponents. A fifth world tier is set to release in a future update, with more possibly on the way as the game enters its second and third seasons. 
There is no question that Ubisoft wants players to know that they are focused heavily on in-game content for The Division 2. It was, after all, one of the most disappointing factors in the first game. There is no doubt that The Division 2 is a far cry more improved than Ubisoft's first go at open world looter shooters. And that is saying a heck of a lot, given how much we loved the first game. In our opinion, The Division 2 is the perfect sequel. It improves upon the first with vastly superior loot cadence, a very rewarding player progression system, and a heck of an endgame that promises many more hours beyond the first 20 that you have to spend getting there.